We'll call this an episode of Ask Dr. C. The situation is that people ask questions about things that they see in their other math classes or just out in the world. And uh, while I would encourage everyone to go and do some internet research of your own, it's certainly one of the things that I value as a learner now that wasn't around when I was coming up. This time on Ask Dr. C, the question is about a very famous formula that you might encounter some places. And, and this person encountered this formula and asked me what's going on with it. And this is sometimes called Euler's formula, although Euler being who he is, that doesn't really narrow it down. Now this is, this is the way you'll see this formula a lot. e to the pi i equals negative one. This isn't the way I was taught to write this formula. And I think there's something that's aesthetically wrong about writing it that way. It doesn't really matter but it's, I don't know, something I've always been picky about. I got to know this formula from the math professor that really got me into math with the one on the other side. And what was special to him about it and what's special to me about this formula now is it's a single equation that contains the five most important numbers in the history of the world. Now, maybe you'd beg to differ on what are the most important numbers in the world, and maybe that'd be a fun thing to hear back about. Um, in particular, the number here that maybe people are least familiar with is the number E. In trying to answer this person's question, and the question was, what does this formula mean? Why is it true? Um, what does it even mean to raise a number to a number like pi i? In answering that question, we're going to want to find out what E is. Um, we all come across it at some point in high school algebra or pre-calc or something like that. Um, but certainly, in my own experience, I discovered that I didn't really know what E was at some point. So in trying to get to the bottom of this formula, we first want to know what the heck E is, and then maybe what it means to raise a number to another power that's not something like 2 or 3 or 4. So let's start there. Let's start with E. What kind of a number is E? Um, some of you might know the word transcendental to attach to it, meaning that it's not only not a whole number, it's not a fraction or a rational number, it's not even a, what's called an algebraic number, where you can create this number as the solution to a polynomial equation with integer or rational coefficients. Uh, this is called a transcendental number. Everything else that's in the real numbers or the complex numbers, other than the things we have easy ways to make. That's essentially what transcendental numbers are. And we can go more into that later, but it's not just E being transcendental that makes it hard to put our finger on. Because pi is transcendental, this was proved in like 1862 or something like that, um, but pi, we know what pi is, even if we don't know what its digits are, let's say. Pi is defined as if you take a circle, take its circumference, and divide it by its diameter. That's what pi is. Pi is that thing. And E I don't know about your experience, but in my own experience, uh, I didn't really have a good definition of it. At least one that felt like I could put my finger on it the way I can with pi. Now, the definition we usually do get in like a pre-calc text or something like that is it's the limit as n goes to infinity of one plus one over n raised to the n. So already, just by using the language of limits, that makes E a pretty complicated thing. Um, and the background for where this comes up in that, in that sort of pre-calculus textbook, this is like a, a section on compound interest. And so this sort of looks like the equation for compound interest, except that what happens is instead of compounding at discrete points in time, you end up compounding continuously. And then so E is, is sort of treated to be that function. Um, this is a pretty complicated definition though, and it's, I don't know, uh, compound interest doesn't come up a whole lot in my life. I mean, I pay it, but, but I don't have to think about it a lot. Whereas E, I get the sense from my math classes that E is somewhat of a fundamental number in nature. And so already there's a little bit of a mismatch in, in terms of like what we're told E is, and then how it ends up being important later. Somewhere in high school, you get this definition of E, and then you get used to E a little bit, and, you know, and then you keep using it, and you use it more and more as you go into calculus and other classes, and you never get back to the point you say, but yeah, but what E is E, and why did it matter? 
So that, that's what I would like to do today, is to give you a different definition of E to go with. And, and this is uh, something that Euler gave to us. Again, get a lot of stuff from Euler. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to go through this limit definition just a little tiny bit, maybe a little bit more than you get a chance to see. Now that whole idea of a limit definition or a limit of anything is to be able to think about what happens when you plug bigger and bigger and bigger numbers into this. And you could certainly use a calculator and choose some n and get an exact value here. And depending on the, big, the bigness of that n you choose, you should get a number that's close to the decimal approximation of e, 2.71, whatever. So I guess it does at least give you a, an easy way to approximate it. But if we imagine n getting really, really big, then 1 over n gets really, really small, which means this is pretty much 1. And then this is a really, really big number. So 1 raised to a really, really big number is just 1, because if you raise 1 to anything, you get 1. So this is a, a good example of the kind of limit you get on a test in a calc class, because you can't just look at it right away and tell what's going to happen. Now, we could do some diversions into calc class, but I don't want to do that. I just want to point out that it's not clear from looking at this what kind of a number it creates, or that it even settles down on a finite number at all. That's something you need an extra level of insight to, to approach. What I'd like to do now is to show you a different way to think about E. Well, I'll just show you the definition first, and then we can talk a little bit more about its context. So I'm going to say that E is the number we get when we start with 1, and then we add 1 half, and then we add 1 sixth, and then we add 1 24th, and then we add, and I'll give away the secret here, this very simple pattern and creating a, a number that's defined as a number that continues out towards infinity as you keep writing it. Um, that doesn't mean the number itself is infinite. In fact, I think if you, if you take a look at these fractions a little bit, you'll see that the numbers that we're adding get smaller and smaller and smaller. There's a fancy way to write this, and I think writing things in the fancy way is one of the real benefits of studying math at a high level. It doesn't get talked about enough. I feel smart when I write things with a big sigma. I always have. That's one of the things that led me to study math in school. Um, so you should enjoy it instead of being afraid of it. This is what E should be. Now one of the problems is that this, this method of adding on numbers after one another and going and going and going, uh, this infinite series approach, the way we schedule math class, it doesn't happen until you get to Calc 2 in most cases. So all the way in college, long after your other classes would have introduced E to you. Um, the nice thing about it though is that Infinite series, and even in a minute when we start talking about power series, sort of infinite series that represent functions, not just numbers, are not too hard to wrap your head around. Because if I stop instead of going out forever, this is just a fraction. This is a rational number, and it has a simple pattern that you can keep following if you want to go out farther. Um, and that's also the appeal to Euler. So you can, you can pick up from the word transcendental number or in the case of functions, transcendental functions, or what we call sine and cosine and e and those things like that, you can pick up from the name transcendental that it's something that's beyond earthly means. And in general, that's, that's how things end up working out. That there's sort of this, this easy world of polynomials and finite computations, uh, but then anything that's curved ultimately in a lot of ways ends up uh, being on another plane away from that. And so what Euler did, and, and a lot of other analysts at this time did this too, was they thought, well, we need to start with the stuff that we're comfortable with, the finite polynomial stuff. And then we can see the curve things as, as sort of what we approach in the limit, what happens when you keep going. And that ends up being a really good approach here for E. So Euler defined E to be this number. Now it's not clear yet why this particular pattern ends up being important, um, but I think it makes a lot more sense, for instance, when you get to calculus and you want to take the derivatives of sine and cosine and e to the x, and then their derivatives turn out certain ways. And then once you learn the power series for these functions, you can see the way that the process of taking a power series generally 
gives you this as sort of the simplest function that's going to turn out the way it does. And everything fits together a little bit better than that previous definition of E where why is compound interest come out so nicely when you're doing derivatives and integrals? It just, there's, there's a disconnect there. And this gives us a, a more central way to think about E if we're planning to do some calculus later. And the next goal that I have is to show you what we might mean by raising a number to a weird power. So again, the trick here that Euler did was to go as simply as possible and then to hope there's a way to make sense of it in the end. So he defines e to the x as almost the same thing. This is one. Plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial. So you just take that basic pattern and shove x in there, essentially is what you do. This is the definition, sometimes people write these colon equal signs, of e to the x. Now, as of yet, we don't know why someone would choose to write that this way with an x up here in the exponent spot. But the idea of this function is pretty straightforward. It's, you can think about it as just a polynomial, except that you would keep going and writing out terms if you really wanted to, but along the way you can stop. Uh, and then the other thing that we can do over here on this right side that's hard to imagine over here on the left side is we can plug in numbers. So that's exactly what you can do. The first number I'm gonna plug in is zero. What happens when x equals zero? Well, if we plug in it on the left side, we're gonna get e to the zero. So hopefully, given the rules that I've been told for exponents, hopefully that comes out to one. Now let's see what the right-hand side looks like. Plugging in zero to a polynomial is usually pretty easy. That's one, that's zero, that's zero, that's zero, that's zero. They're all gonna be zero after that first one. The right-hand side does equal one. What other easy numbers should we plug into this formula? X equals one. What happens when we plug that in? Well, the left-hand side, we're really hoping that en that ends up being e to the one, which should be e given our usual rules for exponents and everything. Now if I plug in on the right hand side, what am I gonna get? I'm gonna get one plus one plus one half plus one six plus one over four factorial, on and on and on. Now is that the same thing that we had up here for E? No, not quite, and that's because I messed up. So maybe we should take our definition of E. That should be our definition for E. That way we get the same number for plugging in one up there and one number down there. And it's not like you can't define that number. That number makes just as much sense. It's just one smaller. Um, so if I want all the sequence of these things coming out to be, I should have had my original definition with one plus one. No big deal, as they say. Okay, so assuming I have the right definition of E now, and assuming I know how to plug in a couple other things, um, I can certainly plug in other things that are sort of, I don't know, maybe they would come up somehow, like two, x equals two, I could plug it in, and then I could do some algebra and plug some stuff into my calculator and get an approximation. You might worry that having two as a number here, getting raised to the third and to the fourth and to the fifth and to the sixth, might have a problem that instead of looking like a fraction that gets smaller, that might turn into infinity really quick if we're not careful. Now, this is maybe one of the areas that causes people to sort of leave series for later until people have had some time to think about some other things, but I don't think it's super detrimental. It's just another little piece that we got to remember. Um, it turns out that factorials grow really, really, really quick. Compared to taking the power of a constant number, they overwhelm that situation by quite a bit. And maybe we can talk about that next time, but I do want to get to that Euler's formula. So it turns out that no matter what positive number you, you plug in there, it'll never be big enough to overwhelm this factorial as it goes on out. And so e to the n for any positive number n 
we'll be fine. But that wasn't really what we wanted to do with e to the x. What we really want to do with e to the x, now that we've got this formula, we want to plug in weird things. So let's try that out. And now I'm going to plug in something weird. For those just joining the conversation, i is, is called the imaginary number. It's the square root of negative 1. If you stick around with math long enough, it'll stop seeming imaginary and start seeming like a very natural and important number to have in your world. Hopefully this is the first step of, of making that happen if it hasn't yet happened for you. So e to the i is going to equal 1 plus i plus i squared over 2 factorial plus i cubed over 3 factorial plus on. Well, maybe I'll do one more because I have one more up there. So i to the 4th over 4 factorial. Also, something nice happens when you take i's fourth power. So again, i is defined as something that when you square it, you get minus 1. And even though i might feel weird to us, and this is historically how complex numbers came about, even though i feels weird to us and like, how can such a thing exist, we can still do algebra with it. So let's go for it. So in the same way, the left side, left hand side of this equation feels really weird. The right hand side, though, we can do algebra with. And it's minus one, two factorial. And then i cubed is minus i, because I get i squared, that's minus one. And then I get another square root of factorial. And i have a fourth is one over four factorial. Okay. So what can we see about this? I, I, you know, the, the i's sort of fall out a little bit, but there's still a little bit of a mess there. Either the i isn't going to be some nice magical number, um, at least not for these purposes. It's going to have a real part, one minus two factorial plus four factorial minus six factorial. You know, every every even term is going to turn out to be real. Every odd term is going to have is going to turn out to have an i there. And so, while we don't get any great insight from plugging in i, we also see it's not so hard. No big deal. Here's where we're going to have to do something besides just e, and we're going to have to put another piece of the puzzle together before we can go farther. This is called a power series, and we defined e to the x to be this function. But it's not the only function that has such a power series. In the time that Newton and Leibniz and Euler lived, it was even sort of taken to be the same way that we approximate a number like pi with a decimal expansion. It's so many ones plus so many tenths plus so many hundredths plus so many thousandths on and on and on with our decimal system. It felt very natural, always present, that you could think about any function in terms of a power series that would represent it. Now it turns out reality isn't that doesn't make that correspondence perfect, but it still works a bunch of the time. And so what we're going to want to have for our uses here is two more power series. Sine x and then cosine x. And the easy way to remember them is that sine x is the odd powers for an odd function and cosine x is the even powers for an even function. <laughs> sine x is Cosine is the even powers for an even function. Minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 1 over 4 factorial minus x to the 6 over 6 factorial. Now where did I pull these power series from? It could be a lot of places. We could do like what Euler did with e and just define them this way and then see how things work out. We could also do calculus. If you take the, the first derivative, your power series, you should be able to match that up with the first derivative of the function, and so on and so forth. So you could do this for more elementary in the sense of being based on regular old calculus means, as well as sort of taking for granted that you know how to take the derivative of sine and cosine, which might be another thing to look into. So I want you to keep these two functions in mind along with this one. Notice right away that they look kind of similar. And then what I want to go and do, so I want to go back to where I plugged in i, and I'm going to plug in ix. Let's go ahead and erase this. Let's do something even simpler. x equals ix. So e to the ix equals, I'm just plug in, 1 plus ix plus i squared x squared. So i squared is minus 1. And then I'm going to get, oops, no, minus ix cubed over 3 factorial. And then I'm going to get a plus. At this point, I have 4 powers of i, so it just totally goes away and turns into 1. x to the 4th over 4 factorial minus, or plus ix to the 5th over 5 factorial. On and on and on, and keep going. And then what we notice is if we gather up the real and imaginary parts, so I'm going to gather the real parts, so 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial. That's the real part. And then I'm going to take i times the other part, and I'm going to get x 
minus x cubed over 3 factorial minus x to the fifth over 5 factorial. Oh, no, no. And what I realize is that this is cosine and this is sine. So in fact, I guess I'll jump down here. E to the ix ends up giving us, by the power series, cosine of x plus i sine of x. And that's all we need to be able to finally plug in pi i to see what we get. We sort of avoid a little bit the general question of what it means to raise something to something. Um, and, you know, if we were building up this theory from scratch, we might want to go back and make sure that the kind of arithmetic we expect exponents to do actually works out up here. And it turns out that it does, and you get it from this and all the angle multiplication formulas, known as Dewab's formulas, even though he didn't have anything to do with them as far as I know. So, all right, this is our new magic relationship. This is the thing to really remember. I mean, the, the formula we started out with is sort of the parlor trick, but this is the real gold. And we're going to use that and just plug in. That's the magic of power series. Now, eventually you have to pay the bill in terms of convergence, but that can wait until you get to advanced calculus for someone to worry about that. All right, so this is my new e to the i x is my new gold cosine x plus i sine of x. All right, I'm going to plug in x equals pi because I want the the exponent to be pi i. So on the left hand side, I get e to the pi i. And the reason I'm writing that backwards from how it's written up there is that it flows off the tongue well when you say pi i. Normally, I guess I'd write the i first because you sort of separate real and imaginary parts, but i pi sounds terrible. Pi i sounds great. All right, and then I'm just going to plug in. So it's cosine of pi plus i times sine of pi. Now, I don't know how long it's been since you've last seen your unit circle, but pi is 180 degrees. It's over there. Its size, that's minus 1. And then pi has no height on that unit circle. So that's all you get. E to the pi i equals 1. And then again, if we want it to sound right and look right and be extra magical, we rewrite it that way. And so that finally is why e to the pi i plus 1 equals 0.